process of inferiorizing the native, uh, sorry, um, inferiorizing the native, which was the essence of colonization, was bound up with the process of enthroning male hegemony. Furthermore, within the European imperial tradition, the existence of, quote, colonial rhetorical deployment of the African female body to signify Africa, end quote, was marked by a feminized and eroticized foreign space, but with also with displaced sexual aberration and excess. And thus, African female bodies became those that needed to be controlled and subdued. It was this very, quote, inscription of deviance on the African female body that formed claims about the moral superiority and authority. And in turn, these claims became moral arguments for colonization. The gendered and racialized justification for colonialism also extended into Germany's paternalistic governance of the colony. As the very presence of Herrera women within the colony remained a constant challenge to Germany's territorial aspirations, it soon became increasingly viewed as a much more menacing threat when German settlers began interacting with the natives, specifically native women. While German settlers continued to look down on Herrera women as members of an inferior race, many still married them due to the lack of women in the pre excuse me, European women present in the colony. The children produced by these unions, however, further fueled pre-existing anxieties over racial pollution and degeneracy. Alongside an increasingly biological understanding of race was a European racialized conception of pollution in which, quote, African blood was regarded as such a powerful pollutant that those infected with it were permanently excluded from the white race, end quote. A German judge in the High Court of Windhoek Further, this understanding, declaring that once a bloodline had, quote, been contaminated with black blood, nothing could change the status of subsequent generations, showing just how dangerous and permanent miscegenation was viewed to be. Additionally, as German law granted citizenship to any children of German fathers, there existed a fear that these children would be able to transgress national borders and infiltrate German society, becoming, quote, internal enemies whose black blood would seep into the white population itself, end quote. Colonial Governor Lutwein warned that the colony was quickly becoming a, quote, bastard colony, and thus combating this new racial threat became a colonial imperative. The worry that going native would eventually mean the end of the German people extended back home to Germany, and there grew an increasing worry that pure Germanness would be lost in the colonies. In addition to these alleged risks that Herrera women were seen as posing to the purity of the German bloodline, the emergence of venereal disease outbreaks within the colony was also ascribed to these women's, quote, lurid sexuality, which was furthering the racialized understanding of Herrera women as a pollutant. By 1905, mixed marriages were prohibited in the colony, and 1907, steps were being taken to dissolve pre-existing interracial marriages. Yet while some measures were introduced to disincentivize white Germans for entering into such relations, the primary focus of this legislation and oppressive restrictions was on African women. Not wanting to impede upon white German men's sexual liberties, Black women were punished instead, hoping to discourage them from participating. Yet these increasingly restrictive laws attempted to curb interracial relations and the rise of mixed racial children, they did little to protect Herrera women from German men. As scholar Laura Wildenthal notes in her study on women and empire, the quote, old pattern of marriage, long-term cohabitation, public liaisons, and rape was replaced by the new system of prostitution, secret liaisons, and rape. However, the cultural importance of sexual access to women of color did not change. Campaigns were soon launched to recruit white German women to move to the colonies, hoping the presence of white women would help curtail interracial relations. Not all were convinced that racial mixing was solely to be explained by the lack of white women present, and colonial economist Moritz Bond claimed that the, quote, main cause of bastardization in Africa was not the absence of white women, but the presence of black ones, end quote thus extending the trope of the dangerous and sexually tempting Herrera women. Nevertheless, through a system of subsidized travel and incentives, the first white German women were sent to Southwest Africa, and by 1907, there were over 500 living in the colony. The first wave of German white women in the colony was not universally welcomed by German male settlers, many of whom viewed their presence as a nuisance and a liability. A large percentage of these women who emigrated were feminists and free thinkers, and many chose to move who saw the colonies as a space where a new, German society could be created and the colonies would act as laboratories for the renegotiation of gender as well as the creation of the new women. Thus, the very presence of white women in the colonies further reinforced gender anxieties for German men, both in these women's perceived vulnerability and their, quote, need for protection, as well as for the challenge to the gendered order they posed. It was within this dynamic of heightened gendered and racialized tensions that the Herrero uprising and ensuing genocide must be understood. After escalating tensions arose over German predatory land seizures and continued settlement patterns, the
the Herrera revolted in January 1904, killing over 100 German settlers in Okahanja. Despite a publicly acknowledged Herrera policy of not harming women or children, referred to Germans living at the time as the, quote, savage code, three German women were murdered during the revolt. It was specifically the deaths of these women that were used by the German colonial government to explain and justify the extreme brutality that would follow. German colonial forces responded to the Herrera uprising through a series of military actions and violent targeting that escalated into a genocidal pursuit to wipe the land clean once and for all. The first phase of the genocidal violence was marked by widespread massacres of the Herrero, including the bayoneting of babies, rape and torture of women, and indiscriminate killings. The German colonial forces forcibly drove the Herrero deep into the desert and through a policy of attrition, blocked all exits and poisoned the water wells in an effort to annihilate the entire Herrero peoples. Despite overwhelming military superiority, the Germans continued to spread propaganda about the grave threat posed by the Herrero. Rumors of atrocities spread amongst the military and settlers alike, in which powerful fantasies of violence and voyeuristic horror in the form of graphic, generally sexualized accounts of violence towards German women were used to provoke indignation and elicit further support for the German state's actions, both within the colony and at home. Wartime propaganda circulated that depicted the German nation itself as a white woman being preyed upon by, quote, dark-skinned natives. And the general theme of such messaging followed a formula in which the male enemy was presented as one who would, quote, rape and murder our women, and the war effort was the only way to save our women. Yet as Justine Kruger notes, these colonial fantasies about, quote, the virility and savagery of African men overlapped in the war with a silence and denial about the behavior of one's own side. While fabricated stories of Herrero gendered violence ran rampant, German gendered atrocities committed during this period were generally and conveniently left out in the narrative. In reality, the Herrero upheld their promise to exclude German women and German children from the violence. Witness accounts described how in many cases, Herrero men would safely escort any German women and children they encountered back to German forces, often at great risk to their own safety. The brutal and gendered violence described in these fabricated atrocity tales that circulated was actually demonstrated by the Germans, who utilized sexual violence and symbolic targeting of women as a method of reasserting what was perceived to be a challenge to their own masculinity. The Germans' extreme brutal, gendered, and racial violence can additionally be understood in a larger framework of gendered colonial power. As, quote, national prestige was measured in part by colonial conquest, end quote, the Herrero's uprising challenged the German colonial rule by an assumed weaker and effeminate race provoked larger anxieties over the very masculine authority of the colonial order. The fear that this gendered challenge could spread to other colonies and thus weaken Germany's prestige on the international stage meant that the uprising and those responsible needed to be dealt with as quickly and harshly as possible to prevent a recurrence. Herrera women were additionally understood as a specifically gendered threat, portrayed as, quote, black Amazons swinging clubs and castrating their foes, end quote, and rumors of Herrera women joining their men on the battlefield, as well as participating in sexual mutilations and castrations of fallen German soldiers was widespread. Herrera women's alleged participation in battle served thus as a justification for their brutal treatment by German soldiers. Whereas killing women in war may still have been viewed as a taboo in Europe, German soldiers' behavior could, quote, be seen at least as excusable when seen as revenge for the white women sacrificed. Within Germany, upon hearing the Herrera women and children were being targeted on the battlefield, Chancellor Bulov instructed the General Chief of Staff Schlieffen to ensure that in any event, quote, under no circumstances were women and children to be shot any longer, to which Schlieffen replied the above quote. The colonial dehumanization of Herrera women, as evidence in the zoological language ascribed to them, facilitated German soldiers' ability to transgress the boundaries of normative and civilized military behavior in their gender targeting and murder of Herrera women. Thus, Herrera women joined their men and children deep in the desert, and after thousands had died from exhaustion, starvation, and dehydration, the Herrera were forced to surrender to German colonial troops. Surviving Herrera were subsequently rounded up and captured and interned in concentration camps throughout the colony, ushering in the second phase of gendered violence. Within the camps, prisoners were divided into two categories, those who could work and those who could not. Those able were sent to slave labor, to construction projects throughout the colony, regardless of their gender, and those unable remained in concentration camps, where they faced starvation, disease, rape, brutal beatings, and murder. As it was mostly women and children who were imprisoned in these camps, as the majority of battle-aged men had been summarily executed, it was within the camps that the gender treatment of Herrera women can be seen most clearly. Imprisoned Herrera women were uniquely singled out by the Germans, targeted by physical gendered violence, such as rape, sexual violence, and slavery, as well as symbolic gendered violence that targeted their status as mothers and culture bearers. Sterilizations, public violence towards women and children, 
and other gendered forms of humiliation targeted Herrera women specifically for their status as women and their symbolic connection to the social body of the Herrero. Children were often killed in very public fashion, involving hanging, bayonetting, burning alive, and other forms of mutilation, and served to symbolically strip women's roles as mothers, as well as simultaneously destroy the next generation. The rape of Herrera women, which was by no means uncommon before this period, was a prevalent feature in the German colony, which German settlers referred to acts of sexual violence as Werkefrang, or going native, or the quote, Schmutzstrasse, or the dirty trade. Notably, these descriptions applied to both consensual and non-consensual interracial relations, with the assumption being that Native women's consent was implied in their very viable existence. During the period of imprisonment, rape increased and became actively celebrated. The sexual targeting of women also had a communicative function in which, quote, men received messages of elimination through the sexual victimization of women, end quote. Molly Pepper, in her study on sexual violence and masculinity, describes how, quote, rape has become a tool for white men to maintain their dominant position over black men, when white men assault black women, or when rape myths about black men's violation of white women are perpetrated. Sexual violence in this way becomes a tool for asserting racial dominance through the violation and demonization of racialized bodies. In addition to their symbolic communicative function, Herrera women also served as literal methods of communication. When General von Trotha issued his famous extermination order to the Herrero, it was written onto a note that was tied onto the very neck of imprisoned Herrera woman who was then driven back to the desert. Sexual abuse of Herrera women further served as a gender genocidal method of communication within the camps, and atrocity postcards were circulated by German soldiers and guards with images of forcibly posed FUMA prisoners in humiliating and exploitative sexualized positions. These photographs reflected what Elizabeth Baer refers to as the genocidal gaze, which, quote, objectifies women as sexual objects to be used and then used up, end quote. She furthers that while the photos fulfilled, quote, German male fantasies of the submissive Black woman, in addition to their sexual purposes, such images were symbols and affirmations of colonial power exerted over African women, in which the naked woman paradoxically has their sexuality emphasized, but their humanity stripped. Thus, atrocity photographs and postcards, which circulated both within the camps and the colonies, as well as were sent back home to Germany, worked to simultaneously communicate to the Herero their continued submission, as well as to reaffirm to German men their own masculine power and control. Female prisoners were subjected to additional eugen me, eugenics-based racial and scientific experiments involving sterilization and other invasive reproductive procedures under the guise of curing their ongoing venereal disease outbreak. In 1906, a monthly medical report, venereal disease showed that had risen a stunning 93.3% within the colony, causing widespread panic. Yet rather than assuming the sexual outbreak was due to the ongoing policies of rape and sexual enslavement in the concentration camps, colonial authorities blamed Native women for their perceived sexual depravity and polluting effects and focused their effects or their attentions on reaffirming their uncivilized nature. The efforts to combat the continued spread of venereal disease further justified German colonial rule and provided opportunities for Germany to extend its domination over its colonial subjects. The invasive and humiliating medical examinations practiced on Herrera women continued long after the camps closed. In closing, when the last concentration camp camps were closed in 1908, 80% of the total Herrera population had been annihilated. While the violence may have officially ended, many of the genocidal systems and structures remained in effect and many continue to this day. The genocide transformed the once dominant Herrero into a racial minority. And in today's Namibia, they remain dispossessed from their land, economically impoverished and politically disenfranchised. Modern day Herrero have also struggled to renegotiate their traditional cultural practices in the aftermath of the genocidal violence. An examination of the gendered experiences of the Herrero can help to uncover the larger dynamics of race, sex, and power within the colonial and genocidal framework. Understanding the interplay between these competing yet often intertwined concepts demonstrates that their effects do not simply disappear when the violence ends and the ongoing tension in Namibia today between reestablishing and recreating Herrera culture and gendered identities amongst both men and women is proof that the continued legacies of the destructiveness of the gendered nature of the genocide and serves to question if 1908 can truly be considered the genocide's official end. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, if anybody had questions, please um, put them in the chat and we will gather the questions at the end of all three presentations. Um, I'd like to now invite Carl Maropa to speak about Zimbabwe. Thank you.
Hello, everyone, and good morning. Um, I will be sharing uh, my presentation, and I hope I am audible to everyone. Um, uh, if, uh, if I'm audible, then I can surely begin. Women were instrumentalized in the first and the second Chimorengas, or anti-colonial struggles in the Zimbabwean war as freedom fighters, as divinators, as aides, among other roles that became necessary in the effort to win the liberation struggle. Conversely, the stories of women who were brutalized, raped, and pillaged by the colonial forces. Uh, beg your pardon, let me just turn on my video. Thank you. Uh, conversely, the stories of these women who were brutalized and raped uh, and pillaged by the colonial forces in the fight were never told. So to the freedom fighters, women were a conduit of hope, resources, and military support. Yet to the enemy forces, women were objects of pleasure, oppression, and a means to dominate their enemies. As a result, women were forced to vacillate between these two existences, harboring an outward fight within their own beings. So my presentation, my presentation today argues that women experience a war within a war in times of conflict, becoming themselves the battlefield of violence, genocidal intent, and dominance. War gives women two options. To one, pledge their bodies as useful collateral for their own fighters, or to give up their bodies as helpless plunder for the enemy. So my presentation will then analyze the first and second Chimuringa from a decolonial feminist lens to unpack the unspoken fate of women as the ultimate trump card of war. So when we're looking at the Chimuringa or the Umvukela uh, in Debele, the local language, we're looking at the liberation struggles or the wars that were fought to ensure Zimbabwe's independence. These date back or these span between 1890 and 1980, where the two wars served different purposes but outlined the struggle that women faced throughout. From the early 19, from the early 1890s, we have the second Chimur the first Chimuringa, which was a war that was fought together in collaboration with the Shona and the Ndebele people, who were the majority ethnic groups within the country, as a way to stop them, or at least as a way for them to, to, to go against the, the rulership of the British South Africa Company, which had come in um, from Britain to occupy. Uh, the north of the Zambezi, which is where Zimbabwe was located. Now, in trying to overcome the colonial oppression of the the colonial oppression of the second of the first liberation war, these individuals had to go come together through the leadership of their native leaders, who then initiated a fight against the British South African Company police and were overthrown as a result of military strength of the British South Africa Company, which had domiciled itself within the region. But this then continued into them becoming a settler regime under the rulership of Ian Smith, who actually uh, renounced his uh, tie to the British government when they had said, or when the British government had issued a decree that the colonial, the colonial states that had been occupied were supposed to be ruled by majority rule. But in this case, because Ian Smith did not want to have a majority black owned government where he would reside, he decided to create some sort of splendid isolation, which ensured that he was ruling Zimbabwe on his own and his independence was never recognized. But through and through, Zimbabwean individuals, Zimbabwean fighters and Zimbabwean, the Zimbabwean population in general were experiencing the hardships of oppression. They were experiencing the hardships of economic ostracization. They were also experiencing oppression of different kinds, especially the one that occurred to women as a result of their lowly status or their second class citizen status which was also legislated within Zimbabwe's early laws. So between 1980, between 1890 to 18, 18 between 1890 to 1960, um, that was the period within which, within which Zimbabwe was experiencing um, some oppression, which the native traditional leaders tried to try to fight for. But from the nine, from 18, from 1960 to 1979, that's where we have the second Chimuringa war, which was fought by the guerrilla fighters who were trying to pull out um, the white majority government and to assert nationalist beliefs. So what we really want to focus on here is the removal of the woman's story from the history of Zimbabwe. So there has been a grand omission uh, where we're looking at whether or not women were indeed instrumentalized or used as bait or used as weapons and tools to facilitate the war effort. So my approach would take an African feminist approach to say who actually wrote the stories that we're hearing within Zimbabwe's current history, because Zimbabwe was formerly Rhodesia. And Rhodesia had many writers who wrote about the Zimbabwean struggle. But this was also difficult for them to unpack because they were never 
interviewed as contributors or respondents in some of the studies that were taking place. And so the focus was on the white uh, writers who were present within that time. We also take a decolonial perspective to the storytelling. What did they leave out? And as the case shows, many of the stories of women who were pillaged and abused um, and oppressed were not actually included within the history of Zimbabwe's storytelling. Then the last aspect or the last lens I will be using is social justice. Where is their voice? And we see that even in present day Zimbabwe, several accounts of the historical occurrences within the struggle of the liberation or the liberation struggle itself, we still do not find many women writers who express the struggles and oppressions that women experience during this time. So instrumentalization in this case refers to how women in Zimbabwe's liberation struggles looked at their strategic use, or it looks at the strategic use of women's participation in the conflicts to achieve political, social, and military goals. And women did play a significant role in the liberation struggle, but their contributions were largely left out and were shaped by the gender dynamics of the time, knowing that Zimbabwe was a patriarchal society where things such as male primogeniture or just the celebration of the boy child was prevalent during this time. We also need to look at the characterization of women during the liberation struggle, which is a lens that is not often used in a way that celebrates the role of women um, during the liberation struggles or the two Chimurengas. Women were seen as having double jeopardies, or I guess within the analysis, we begin to see that women occupied two sets of characterization. And these double identities created a double jeopardy, which we initially said that showed that women would either have to be spoils of war or tools to be used to achieve the war effort. The first one being that women were victims and conduits. So we were relying on women's agency, either as second class citizens who would move in and within the, the fighting spaces without being seen or detected, or as being individuals without a status that would be so alarming um, to consider them as enemies. But we then begin to see that as the war effort was going on, uh, moving towards independence, more and more women are beginning to see, more and more women were being viewed now as adding to the effort in a very significant way. For example, Mbuya Nehanda is a celebrated um, traditional leader or spirit medium within the Zimbabwean folklore surrounding the liberation struggle, who was known to have uh, stood in the face of white supremacist rule during the time, um, white or colonial oppression, during the time and enabled um, us to fight the first uh, the first Chimurenga, but also subsequently being celebrated as the medium or at least the spirit that was guiding the second Chimurenga to the time when colonialism was obliterated. The second one is women are also viewed as mothers and lovers. And we use these two terms because on one side of the camp, women were indeed occupying the nurturing role for the guerrilla fighters and also on the other side being looked at as the lovers of um, the guerrilla fighters themselves who needed to relieve them, themselves sexually during that time. So there was this unspoken code that made women wives of the, the conflict or wives of the war. And I think this also silenced them in their ability to assert their own sexual reproductive rights, not only because of the context, but also because of the nature of the war itself. The third one is the fact that women were viewed as being offense and defense in terms of war tactics, where some women were engaged in the, in the hostilities themselves as fighters, but also sometimes women are seen as the defense mechanism for sheltering guerrilla fighters and sheltering individuals who were involved in the hostilities themselves and providing medical care where needed. So when we're looking at this instrumentalization, now looking at it more in depth, we're looking at women for the side of freedom fighters and then also for the side of of the colonial army. On the side of the freedom fighters, uh, who are the guerrilla uh, fighters, the nationalist movement led by Robert Mugabe, together with other um, nationalist leaders of the time, they were seen as cooks and food mobilizers for the distribution in households. Um, we also must know that women would take up the role of housing fighters during the war, especially as hiding them or providing them with critical care. Um, so that, that's how they then occupy the role of being mothers. Then we also look at um, women as war wives. Um, obviously, this was done under duress, but women were the property of the fighters, and therefore their sexual gratification um, was all chained to the men that they served at the time. The freedom fighters themselves um, did have some considerable freedom to bed any woman that he chose. Um, but of course, this was subject to trying to add to the war effort. 
as many women saw their contribution being. We also look at women playing the role of being singers and entertainers. Um, and then there were places called postos, which were areas where people would gather to celebrate the work of the guerrilla fighters, but also empower them through song and through dance. We also saw women um, as guerrilla fighters themselves, participating directly within the hostilities. And we also saw young girls called the Mujibas and Chimbuidos. Um, Mujibas were obviously the boys, but Chimbuidos were the girls. Um, girls as spies and messengers um, throughout the conflict um, for the sake of the freedom fighters. Women were also predominantly viewed as diviners or individuals who were spirit mediums communicating with the supernatural world for the war effort. When we're going to the colonial army side, um, which is the army that was led by Ian Smith, there was a lot of women, there were a lot of women essentially who were raped, uh, who were killed to demonstrate military superiority um, to the guerrilla fighters and to the rest of the population, which was choosing um, to go against uh, white, white rule within the, within the country. And then there was also a question of enlisting women. Many women were then enlisted either as spies or as informants, or they were forced to become defectors for the war effort against their will. And in many ways, they could not say no, or otherwise they would suffer the threat of being um, killed. Women were also used as human shields, as many uh, stories of women being put in the limelight of open gunfire have also been documented. But we need to understand why the women played these two interesting roles within the different camps and having them having zero or very limited agency where it comes to where they should be. We need to see that for the freedom fighters or within the war, within the scenario of war, it was seen as a right that citizens have the collective citizens are the collective property of the freedom fighters. And I think this is something that is implied. It's not necessarily declared, but I think um, when we're going through the situation that surrounds the war and the war effort, there is this imputed right that women are able and are present and are ready to serve these particular roles for the sake of the effort of the war. Then it was also seen as a civic duty. Um, the fight is everyone's fight. So within their oppression, they are also participating in the war and they're also playing their part. Now there is then a conflation of what agency looks like or what human status looks like within, within the interpretation of civic duty, because men were seen as fighters who had their full, uh, who had the full capacity and full personality, but women were seen as tools to be used on either side for the war effort. And then lastly, women are also seen as uh, as a useful tactic. Um, so they essentially oiled the wheels of war, either for the side of the guerrilla fighters or um, for the colonial government. So a quick analysis, uh, when we're looking at these um, dual roles that women are playing within, within the war, we also have to know that there were consequences of women participating within these two spaces. And some of these consequences included many women uh, raising fatherless children and becoming widows with no knowledge of their child, of their children's fathers. We also look at the complex interplay of gender, politics, and societal expectations during the conflict, because we often want to extend the, I guess, the marginalization of women to out of conflict situations. But even within a conflict, women still experience the same kind of oppression, if not worse, um, as a result of them being women. We also need to recognize the multifaceted roles that women played. And even in the case of care work now, where within hotel setups, for example, women who do the cleaning, um, they enter when we have left our rooms and the room is clean when we come back. That kind of incognito role that women can play within a particular industry can also date back to how women participated in the war effort as well, where most of their roles were supposed to be discreet and clandestine and done in incognito ways to ensure that the war effort was oiled in one way or the other, which is in and of itself a sign of oppression, but it's one that is not said directly, but it is implied by the situation and by the circumstances. There's also the involvement of women in the liberation struggle. Um, which was used as a propaganda effort, um, especially within the Second Chimurenga War, which involved more countries and more parties um, from Mozambique, from Zambia, from South Africa. The involvement of women stirred something really deep within some of the guerrilla fighters who then joined the war because it was seen as this collective effort that even our women are taking up arms to fight for, fight for freedom. And I think that stirred in something uh, deeply powerful, but also deeply unsettling about what it means for a woman to take up arms 
um, for the struggle? Is it just about them being recognized as a Zimbabwean in that moment? Or it's about saying the times have become so desperate that women, even women are joining the F. And I think that is something that must be interrogated when we're looking at the contribution of women on the part of the guerrillas as also on the part of, um, of the colonial government at the time. We also need to understand that uh, there are many stories of women uh, being brutalized, being raped and being pillaged. Um, but many of these stories were never told. Many of the literature that we read, um, even as uh, one scholar who wrote in 2018 by the name of Ndawana, he, wrote, he writes and says that most of the stories are written from a, from a particular lens, but that does not necessarily glorify women, or at least the women who we think have the smallest voice. Um, so many of the stories of women who were brutalized and raped and pillaged, they are never told. All we see or all we hear are the stories of the men who were brutalized or the men who were killed or the men who became casualties of the war. And I think these male-centered demands of the nationalist movement are more at the front than women's demands because they too had a voice. But it's, it's imperative to also note that these demands are communicated different. Historical accounts of these stories are told from a very male-centric perspective. And so we never really hear the voice of women and what they desired within those fighting situations. So those who actually attended the Lancaster House Agreement, which is the agreement that ended the Second Chimaringa War, ushering in Zimbabwe's independence, the voices that we hear, the images we see, and the accounts, the historical accounts we also experience as a result of that are uh, from the male-centered perspective. Um, so to conclude, women did experience a war within a war during this war itself because they in themselves became the battlefield for conflict when we're looking at how they ensured their participation against their will or even with, with full consent to try and aid the war effort. Many women had to do so under difficult circumstances and with little regard uh, of their agency and their inherent worth and inherent dignity. And that's when it becomes an issue for us to look at it in a decolonial lens from an African feminist lens to ensure that where women actually included within the stories that we're hearing, but more importantly, where they recognize even within their efforts um, during that particular war. What we also must note is that even post the independence or post war, we still see women experiencing different levels of oppression, different levels of inequality, which we're still talking about today, but date back even to historical accounts and historical events within the country. And I believe that it's some of these conversations that should become at the, should come to the forefront when we're looking at the nexus between human rights considerations of women and how genocidal intent plays itself within some of these uh, historical accounts. When we're looking at genocide as the targeted killing of a particular group of people, we also must look to the nuanced ways in which freedom fighters or uh, colonial governments were experiencing these histories and how they conducted themselves together with the women that were involved during those times. I uh, will end uh, my account there and hope to hear more. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for that interesting paper. Um, we now are now going to talk um, for the third and final uh, presentation of this panel. Uh, Ilimana Memesivic is going to be talking about Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I apologize if I butchered your name, but please go ahead and do your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, it's Eklimana Memisevic, so you were very close. My name is uh, hard even for Bosnians, so uh, <laughs> it's completely understandable. So I'm going uh, right now to share my screen. Okay, just a second. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, so um, I'm 
I'm uh, speaking to you today from Sarajevo, from the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and it's 6:15 uh, uh, p.m. Uh, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So my paper today uh, is a, uh, is uh, called or named "To Destroy a People: Rape as a Weapon of uh, Ethnic Cleansing and Genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 1992-1995." So, uh, as the title of the paper. Uh, indicates uh, my uh, my basic argument is that the rape was used as a weapon of genocide i.e ethnic cleansing in bosnia and herzegovina uh, in the, in the in the last uh, war in 1992 1995 so this is just the map of the former yugoslavia uh, in 1991, from 1991, so uh, just to have a sense of what um, countries were uh, like being part of the uh, of former Yugoslavia and where Bosnia and Herzegovina is. So, um, rape and sexual violence were deliberately and methodically used as a weapon of ethnic cleansing and genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina in period 1992-1995. Uh, it is estimated that between 20,000 and 50,000 mostly Muslim uh, girls and women were raped and sexually assaulted uh, in this period, but also many, uh, many men uh, were also uh, sexually assaulted. Um, these rapes were uh, and sexual violence uh, often were committed in the uh, so-called rape camps, uh, which were uh, former hotels, sport halls, high school, primary high schools, primary schools, uh, etc. And many of these women were uh, forcibly in impregnated in order to be uh, inseminated by the Serb seed, uh, as they were told. So, um, and they were intentionally held in these uh, prison camps, in these uh, rape camps, uh, until it was too late to legally or safely uh, do abortion, uh, abortion. So uh, this uh, sexual mass, se widespread sexual violence uh, was uh, actually reported by the two reports. Uh, first one was from uh, Commission of, of Experts, um, UN Commission of Experts, which was published in 1992. Four. Uh, and it is uh, stated, among others, that the practice of so-called ethnic cleansing and rape uh, and sexual violence in particular have been carried out by some of the parties so systematically that they uh, strongly appear to be product of a policy. Uh, similarly, the European Community Report uh, also uh, stated that the horrifying number of Muslim women had been raped and some of the rapes had been uh, have been committed in particularly sadistic ways so as to inflict max maximum uh, humiliation on the victims on their families and on the whole uh, on the whole communities uh, Catherine McKinnon, a law professor from the University of Michigan Law School, uh, we're also doing reports, uh, and uh, she was uh, conducting interviews with the uh, with the former uh, victims, uh, and uh, she stated, "I quote: It is rape unto death, rape is massacre, rape to kill and to make you uh, leave your home and never want to go back. It is rape to be seen and heard and watched and told to others, rape is spectacle. It is rape to drive a wedge through a community to." shatter a society to destroy a people it is a rape it is rape as genocide rape as ethnic expansion through forced uh, reproduction so um icty international criminal tribunal for former yugoslavia uh, actually um did a great job in uh, prosecuting the perpetrators of the sexual violence however uh, unlike uh, ICTR, um, it is not uh, ICTY did not conclude that the uh, at, that rape and sexual violence was part of uh, genocide. Uh, however, uh, one of the uh, one of the first cases uh, heard at uh, ICTY treated uh, it was created case against Ragomir Konarac, Radomir, uh, Radomir Kovac, and Zoran Vukovic. Uh, it was treated as crime against humanity for the first time in history. And also uh, the, it was the uh, first conviction of ensla enslavement as a crime of uh, a crime against humanity. Uh, out of uh, 161 individuals uh, prosecuted at the ICTY, 78 or 48% faced char charges against uh, of rape or sexual violence uh, or had evidence uh, of rape and sexual violence uh, 
of such violence uh, uh, presented against them uh, at the court, but it is just a fraction still uh, of the perpetrators having in mind that uh, um, ICTY received um, received evidence of more than 20,000 uh, 20, rape. I just, uh, uh, I uh, extracted some of some part of the of the judgments against these three uh, perpetrators uh, just to describe uh, or to give you the sense how cruelly uh, rape and sexual violence were committed in uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina for example in the in the judgment it is stated that uh, one protected vit witness uh, described how one night the woman sleeping next to her was raped in full view of the other deten detainees and her 10 year old son at her side in Partisan Hall uh, in Foča. This is the hall, uh, it is former spo sports hall, uh, which used as um, as the rape camps. For instance, Dragomir Kunarac, uh, he's like the, the judgment stated that he um, uh, took witness, uh, took with protected witnesses and uh, kept them for several months in the house in Trnovace, where they were treated as private property, uh, uh, both by him and other uh, other uh, soldiers. Um, Radomir Kovac, the second convicted, um, uh, the evidence pre presented against him showed that uh, girls uh, who uh, were uh, enslaved, uh, they were physically and psychologically detained. Uh, they uh, he he was also um, he was also accused and uh, sentenced sentence for uh, selling one of the witnesses uh, one of the uh, girls uh, protected witnesses and two other girls uh, who were killed uh, in the in the camps etc. Uh, it was particularly um, uh, sadistic uh, in the case of Zoran Vukovic. Um, uh, the evidence presented uh, against him at the court uh, showed that uh, one of his victims were, uh, was a 15 year old um, uh, girl, uh, which he knew because uh, he told her that she uh, she was the same age as uh, as his daughter and uh, who was 15 at the time, and uh, if she uh, he told her that if she hadn't been the same age as his daughter, uh, he would done uh, would have done uh, much worse. Things to her. Uh, another uh, another uh, perpetrators uh, a perpetrator was Dragan Zelenovic. Uh, he pleaded guilty uh, to rape of uh, Bosnian women in Buk Biela in Pocha, including uh, a 15 year old. Zelenovic also admitted to having raped numbers of women in Pocha gymnasium, the partisan sports hall, and Karaman's house. Uh, and to torture, beating, and starving uh, imprisoned uh, women. Uh, this is the extract of the judgment, uh, which showed uh, how uh, supported these perpetrators were by the Serbia uh, Serbian government, uh, also during the uh, committing of the crimes, but also uh, afterwards. So um, it was stated that Mr. Zelenovic was told to leave Pocha and. Uh, uh, he said he came to the Republic of Serbia, went to the police station in Belgrade, where documents were issued to him, a passport with a visa of the Russian Federation and a personal identity card uh, in the name of Branislav Petrovic. Um, Pocha uh, was a small town in eastern Bosnia where these all these uh, rape and sexual violence were committed. And another infamous, uh, infamous city uh, also uh, was Visegrad. It was uh, on the border with, uh, with Serbia, but also uh, on the border with, uh, with Foča. Uh, the whole, uh, practically the whole town was um, in, turned into a rape camp. Uh, one of the uh, most infamous camps in Visegrad was Hotel Vilina Vlas, which was uh, located seven kilometers from uh, town. Uh, it is suspected that at least 200 uh, Bosnian girls and women were held at Vilina Vlas and systematically raped uh, in order to be inseminated by the Serb seed, uh, quote unquote, um, which were, which were uh, told to them by the perpetrators. Uh, again, I quote, they called us Turks, they told us you are not going to give birth to Turks anymore, but uh, but Serbs. Uh, one of the victims, 
uh, who was 17 at the time, uh, told Washington Post uh, that she was taken to Vilina Vlast by, by Milan Lukic. Milan Lukic was the leader of the uh, Bosnian Serb paramilitary uh, group uh, responsible for uh, almost um, all crimes committed in, uh, in Visegrad, including mass and widespread rape and sexual violence. Uh, the victim was taken uh, together with, he, with her 15-year-old sister and 18-year-old uh, friend. Uh, uh, when they uh, they were taken to Vilna Vlas, and when they uh, uh, came there, they were separated and locked in the dif into different uh, rooms. A few uh, hours afterwards, uh, this 17-year-old witness was raped uh, by uh, Milan Lokic. Uh, he told her that she was lucky to be with him since uh, she could have th been thrown into the river uh, with rocks tied around her ankles. Uh, during the uh, during this uh, time in uh, her detention in uh, Vilina Vlas, uh, she said that she heard a loud cry when the door across the hall was opened and recognized the voice of her of her sister, 15 year old sister. She never saw her again nor her uh, friend. After raping her, uh, Milan Lukic returned her to her family. They stayed in Visegrad as long as they could, hoping that her sister would be returned to. However, uh, after her mother went to the police station almost every day for a month, searching for her sister, Lukic said to her, I quote, what do you want? At least I returned uh, one of your daughters. Uh, this uh, uh, testimony was given um, uh, to uh, the journalist Peter Mas, who was working for the Washington Post at the time in the December 1992. Uh, he described how uh, she was uh, very reluctant to tell her uh, to tell her story. But once she uh, started telling her story, uh, he said she uh, uh, she uh, continued nonstop, and uh, uh, she said, I quote, I want to tell the Westerners the real, real truth. I want them to stop these crimes. There are plenty of girls in a worse position than me, uh, end of quote. Um, she later re uh, repeated her testimony during the trial to Milan and said that Lukic before uh, ICTY. Uh, However, these... Um, uh, Milan Lukic was not indicted for the uh, sexual violence and uh, rape, uh, even though he was sentenced to uh, life in prison uh, by the ICTY. Many of the of his uh, victims and uh, um, like other witnesses uh, were not uh, satisfied with the with the decision of the prosecutor uh, prosecution office not to include uh, rape and sexual violence, and in order to uh, Protest it. Uh, I'll just skip uh, a few more, uh, few more st uh, slides. Uh, this is Milan Lukic and the uh, White Eagles, his paramilitary uh, group. Uh, uh, he was like uh, the witnesses and the victims protested the decision of the uh, uh, prosecution office not to include, uh, not to include the. Uh, uh, sexual violence and rape, and they uh, started to tell their uh, own story publicly because we're, they were eager to testify. However, uh, they, they weren't invited, even though uh, testi uh, testimonials of the uh, victims, uh, rape victims and survivors were crucial in uh, rebutting the defense, uh, 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 defense, uh, uh, defense trying to prove that uh, Milan Lukic was not uh, in Visegrad during the, uh, the uh, commission of crimes uh, he was uh, charged uh, with. Um, one of the pro uh, prosecutor uh, in the Milan Lukic case, he described the women who uh, were tortured and violated uh, in Vilna Vlast as some of the most traumatized uh, people he had ever encountered in his work as a prosecutor. However, uh, these women uh, were eager to uh, to uh, continue their fight uh, in uh, recognition of of, uh, of the suffering uh, committed against him, or, or uh, they were uh, they experienced. 
And the other uh, other struggle they are dealing right now uh, is the denial uh, of the crimes committed in general, especially uh, sexual violence and uh, uh, and rape uh, throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, since I was short on time, uh, I had to skip some of my uh, some of my slides. Uh, I will be happy to answer uh, any any questions. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, these are some tough, tough presentations we've heard, but um, they're giving voice to many women who have been voiceless and they're important stories to hear. Um, I have a few questions. I'll probably do them all at once and then the different speakers can choose to maybe elaborate on whichever ones they feel comfortable with. And while I'm asking my questions, I invite the audience uh, who's online to type in their questions um, and we'll be feeding those. But before I give any of my own questions, I'd like to invite the audience here in the room to raise a question. Does anybody have a question or a comment they'd like to raise right now? Okay, so let me let me raise a few. Yeah, oh, sorry, please. Just waiting for a microphone here. Thank you. The, pr the presentations were all so compelling, but my specific question is for Courtney. Um, my background is in Holocaust uh, studies, and of course, there are quite a bit of uh, parallelisms. Um, in particular, I was interested in the this um, policy of miscegenation or the the, the uh, position toward it and wondering um, since there is such a parallel to the way the Jews were uh, depicted as defilers and particularly women, um, I was curious as far as the degree of um, the, let's say the size of the German forces in Namibia and potentially you know you have one generation, to get to the to the um, Holocaust or the roots of the Holocaust, so how much transgenerational trans um, uh, seeding of that um, theory would have happened? Because it is just so strikingly similar. Does that make sense? The question. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, I too started with a background in Holocaust studies. That's what I did my master's research in. And really the way I came across this genocide was with complete shock that it wasn't being taught in conjunction with Holocaust studies. As you know, a generation later, you're seeing similar theories being employed. Um, if you look at a lot of decolonial scholars, they'll talk about the Holocaust as really colonialism being brought back. They talk about the boomerang effect. Um, being brought back to Europe. And that's why it was so horrifying, but that all of these things were tested out on the African continent for long before. Um, when I look at the genocide now, there are a lot of parallels. There is, as we were saying, one generation. I mean, it ended in 1908. Uh, Hitler's elected in 33. Many of these people are still alive. Um, there's some direct linkages where Ermann Goring's father was one of the original. Oh, is there, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm getting messages. They're saying we're having issues and to let Courtney know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think um, it's a fire drill. Oh, shoot. Okay. Nice. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> <laughs> but great presentation, you guys. Oh, thank you. <laughs> wonderful, be wonderful stuff. Same. <laughs> uh, absolutely cruel uh, crimes committed against them. Well, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it's. I'm sorry. I, I just, I just found both your presentations really interesting, especially where where it comes to who was narrating the story, because it's something mm -hmm. I was looking at as well, and how that plays out within the actual the historical formations um, of what we then do after that in the context of memory. I guess the memorialization process, but also mm -hmm. how we reconcile, you know, all these stories to then make sense to future generations or even generations that are currently here. 
Um, so yeah, I was really keen on that. Thank you for giving me the context. Yeah, thank you so much. It was, uh, I didn't have enough time to elaborate. In Bosnia, there is uh, uh, like not only denial of all these crimes, but also glorification and uh, celebration of perpetrators and violence uh, committed against them. So uh, 30 years after all these victims and survivors are now fighting another fight for uh, memory and truth, uh, which is like the continuation of the, of the struggle. Do you also have, uh, I guess, a particular group of people choosing to own the story, own the narrative now, in terms of the history itself? I'm sure um, in Namibia, okay, I'm actually not sure, I may need to find out <laughs> uh, yeah. if, um, if a particular group or a particular government or a particular ethnic um, group, I guess, owns, I guess, the story of how it happened and how they became, I guess, victorious. Do you experience mm -hmm. that kind of reverse um, ownership of, of, I guess, the historical atrocities? Yeah, uh, it's a process and it's a long due process, but it is uh, coming now. Like uh, uh, I, I had an article about the uh, memory wars in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, like the memory of the perpetrators and the narratives they are trying to impose. And now like the victims and survivors voices, uh, this is now a new generation of survivors, like uh, the survivors who were children and now they are starting to uh, own the story they are starting but also what I wanted to point out in my presentation and in general is that the women uh, who survived uh, rape and sexual violence were actually the, uh, the those who uh, fought and managed to uh, get the perpetrators indicted, uh, testify at the court. Now they are uh, they were also involved into um, uh, hunting war criminals. They were like uh, uh, making photos of them, uh, etc. And they they were taking the uh, like the testimonies and uh, uh, evidence, collecting the evidence, and then they would send it to ICTY or the uh, court in Bosnia. So they were the true uh, leaders of all this uh, process. And now uh, whatever ICTY uh, and the domestic courts have done, it's, it is because of them, because they couldn't ignore uh, uh, their, their uh, fight and their persistence. I don't know, Courtney, do you want to weigh in on that if you want? Uh, so with the idea of, um, you know, controlling the narrative, um, you look at it's been primarily through the German audience and Germany Germans. Um, there's still white Germans living in Namibia. Um, they make up only a small percentage, about like 2% of the total population, but they still own 70% of the land. They're one of the largest or probably the largest economic power. And so they wield a lot of cultural influence on how these stories are told. You know, we don't want to rock the boat. Um, it was a very unsettling experience. I went at the beginning of last year and, you know, Germany has done an amazing job recognizing with their own history of the Holocaust. Um, statues have been removed. Words aren't allowed to be said. Things have become criminalized and visiting places that white German Namibians are kind of in the dominant power of certain cities. They are in a time capsule. Um, they talk about colonial amnesia, but it's not amnesia, it's celebration. You walk into a restaurant um, that just has German flags everywhere. It's one of the most patriotic German experiences I've had where even today's Germany kind of downplays their patriotism because of past symbols being used in, you know, unfortunate ways. But they have photos taken of their, you know, bridge club or, of, you know, just people at the pool. And then it shows the date and you're like, wait, that's literally as the genocide was occurring. And this is just this glorious period and there's a nostalgia for it. And it's very unsettling. So they have their own narrative of, what occurred and I went into a bookstore and my guide I was with was like oh shoot don't say the word genocide and like grab my arm I'm like what do you mean wow. I need to get a book on the Namibian genocide he's like yeah yeah yeah. you just need to say like colonial uprising um and he gave me all these words that were approved he's like or the woman will kick you out of the bookstore and I'm like okay wow. I will say genocide they carry the books on it but they don't acknowledge it as one and then you look at the Herero and Nama, so the two most affected communities who were directly targeted. There were other communities also targeted as well, um, though a little bit less. It really depended on where they were placed within the country and whose lands were. So it wasn't really about 
specific groups. It was really more their location. And um, But then the Ovambo who are in power, they see the benefit of receiving foreign aid from Germany. Um, and that right now is what's being paid. There's about a billion dollars being paid, not as reparations, um, not as direct aid, but as foreign aid for the Ovambo government to decide what to do with. Um, so they see this okay. as a really beneficial uh, relationship with Germany and they don't wanna rock the boat there either. Um, then within the Herrero and Nama, there's also victim competition. Um, the Herrero okay. say, yeah. you know, they they were the only ones and the Nama are like, well, well, what about us? And, you know, you see a lot of parallels of like the Roma communities in the Holocaust who were also a direct target and are not really incorporated into um, the narrative in the same way that the Jews were. Um, there's been a re, not a rebranding, but a, a renaming of the genocide where it was the Herrero genocide, then it was the Herrero and Nama genocide, and now it's the Namibian genocide, just to show that other groups were affected, um, but each has their own memory of what occurred, um, their own demands, their own kind of set of expectations, and they're not, they're often conflicting. They're not always, you know, sometimes two groups will join together because one of their aims is being, but sometimes you're seeing white Germans aligned with the Ovambo government, which just doesn't make sense, but both yeah, of their teams are, you know, being, um, there's also issues with reparations where, um, I mean, Israel was given, you know, 10 times that. Um, there were direct payments to Jewish survivors um, and no Herrero member, no Nama member have been given direct aid or direct reparations. Um, there was a, a bit of an apology on behalf of Germany, but when you compare the two situations, um, they're nowhere near the same effort of, you know, reclaiming these stories, hearing these stories. It's just kind of a, can we write a check and move on? Um, the Ovambo government ran on the um, the platform of they were the liberators and they were the unifiers of Namibia. They have a policy of one Namibia for all Namibians. So when certain ethnic um, tensions come up, they see that as something that goes against independence and is breaking apart Namibia. And they're like, we all are Namibians. We all struggled. Um, but not everyone struggled in the same way. And there's there's a bit of yeah. sad thing under the guise of patriotism. Mm, gosh, like I said, I'm not the one moderating the conversation, but I'm just really <laughs> interested in all of this. Um, You're very good at it. it. Thank you so much <laughs> for indulging me because I mean, I'm, I am I have a human rights background. Uh, so my master's was in human rights law, African human rights law to be specific. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess my perspective has always been about trying to glorify the human dignity of women and trying to, see why their exclusion is so contested um and as you were talking about all of this the nostalgia vis-a-vis -vis the celebration vis-a-vis -vis the you know trying to grab the power grab of who owns the history and what that means in terms of reparations or i guess the beneficiation process you know i begin to see that we, we sort of play the history card in a way that benefits us and that continues the oppression of women or at least continues the exclusion and the indignity, because if we continue to, for example, I mean, if if reparations are coming through to the Ohambo government, not as reparations, but as foreign aid, um, that often doesn't trickle down to some of the women as well. Um, obviously, we're dealing with the exclusion from the history, um, but also the fact that women were always subjugated you know, to this kind of oppression, and it does not translate to reparations on the basis of the agenda. But it then it then it then becomes this blanketed oh it's reparations for the people and I guess that's what makes our messaging here more important to say that even as we're not looking at the aftermath of these atrocities and the genocidal actions that we are calling genocidal actions today, I think there should be a more intentional way of cascading these benefits, cascading the messaging, and cascading the memorialization of the of the of the wars themselves or of the conflicts in a way that actually benefits women or at least puts them at center stage. And so it's really interesting to hear about these stories, um, about the different parties involved. I know in Namibia, it was the Germans, in, in Zim, it was the British, and I'm sure for Elimana, the different parties also come in at different times, either trying to blot out their contribution to the atrocities or to try and make up for it, but in a way that seems like it's compensating for, for something that they truly know they did bad. And, um, so I guess for me, like I said, Maybe my background is very limited in terms of how we interpret these things, but I, I've been really fascinated by by how you, you you have couched these issues and how you've also celebrated the fact that women did play a part, and we must also bemoan the fact that these the roles that they played were very deplorable. Um, 
but all the same, they had a contribution to how things played out. So, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so thank much. You. Mm. I'm not sure if they communicated anything. Um, are we are we gonna wait for them here? I think we will. Uh, in the comments, they asked us to wait for them, but uh, oh. I don't know oh, okay, how long fine. should we wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I'm sure we yeah. can wait for them. I think Courtney, you have a comment there uh, from Patrick. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I think right now the conflicting narrative um, is really the idea of who was targeted and who also died, um, and the idea of intent. Um, genocide always hinges on intent. So there were other ethnic groups that died and the Herrero were targeted for genocide. And there's a bit of competition of memory of whether the Nama were indeed targeted. Um, their targeting did come later, they, they were. <laughs> but uh, their targeting came later, they joined um, into, and, and the Herrero and genocide um, is a really interesting one where, you know, with the Holocaust, we know there was intent, but deniers always sees on this, there was no written order, there's no proof that it was ordered by the top. Um, here you have explicitly written policies and intent of extermination um, written and communicated over and over and over. Um, and it occurred with both the Herero and the Nama. There was a timeline difference just because of the nature of the war. Um, but both groups were explicitly targeted. Um, there is a little debate over whether it was German policy or if it was the colonial government that made these rules. Um, whether it came directly from the Kaiser or whether this was, you know, von Trotha and the generals kind of taking the military on their own. Um, but it was very explicit. And the kind of competition of suffering, I feel like we find in a lot of genocides because the Herrera were first to be targeted, but also first to receive some acknowledgement. Um, and so with the Nama being removed from that um, acknowledgement, there kind of comes this uh, effort to be seen and, um, this idea of kind of scarcity of, you know, whether it's resources or just public attention, um, I think has taken over a bit where if one is seen as one thing, one is not. And of course not, there's, you know, endless recognition and nothing dilutes another thing. There were different experiences with both groups um, and genocide takes many forms as well. Um, but the idea of um, kind of a, a competition um, the Herrero are also a little bit better organized, so they've been on the international stage a bit more. Um, they've taken the government, German government to court, um, and they don't always include the Nama in these um, kind of rulings or claims of genocide, and the Nama have yet to receive that same international um, My, uh, All right, you can uh, talk. That's so nice that they... Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. Can... Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm so sorry that we, we end up in this position uh, where we, can't, we cannot continue. Those of us who are in person, we cannot continue the discussion. But I enjoyed so much the presentations. This, this has been a beautiful conversation, uh, Q&A, and uh, here we are. Um, but I'm here to, I'm happy to hear that you continued the discussion. Um, we hope that we we'll soon go back inside. Um, but for now, I don't know if you can hang on. To see the, oh, oh, wait, no, I'm, I'm on Zoom now, Derek. Yeah, I'm on Zoom, yeah. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, so when we're waiting, uh, they told us that it's going to take, um, a few minutes. Uh, we don't we can't tell you exactly how much time, but if you can hold off, like I, I, truly, after this, we're going to have a break of about an hour until one o'clock. Well, here we are, where we are, it's one o'clock or um, 13 hours, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, but 
come back, please come back at one o'clock in about an hour. Uh, we will be, I'm sure we'll be back inside. So, and we try to send messages as much as we can to everyone to, to, to let you know uh, well, what's happening, okay? But one o'clock, if we can rejoin, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much, presenters. Um, uh, Courtney, um, oh, now I'm going to go. I can't say Ermina. Limana, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah, in the car, of course. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a joy. I know that, uh, yes. <laughs> um, I know that um, uh, I know that Karen, I think you presented last year. So thank you for coming back, uh, and we hope to see you uh, soon next year. But stay in touch, and also I hope you can join us this afternoon and tomorrow, of course. There are more talks. Okay. So thank you, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Great job, everybody. It was wonderful. Really enriching presentations. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. But hope we'll see you in an hour. Okay, bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, I hope you can share your details as well, like emails, if you can. Maybe we can continue some of these conversations and you know engage in that way. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure, really. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>